Throughout modern history, world powers have repeatedly fought over this strategically valuable land. Its name means Fragrant Harbor in Chinese, but it could also mean City of Change. This is the story of Hong Kong. The first wave of people to arrive in large numbers had fled Genghis Khan and his brutal Mongol hordes. They chose Hong Kong because of its advantageous geography. 150 million years ago, volcanic eruptions formed a deep but narrow harbor with an island on the other side. This orientation protected ships from storms and allowed vessels to come and go quickly from either side. With 230 islands, the region was the perfect hangout for pirates. One of the most successful in history was Madame Ching, who, alongside her husband, commanded 80,000 buccaneers and a fleet of 800 ships. In the early 1800s, British merchants found Hong Kong the perfect port to unload the opium they had brought from India. With addiction rampant, the Chinese government cracked down. British-controlled warehouses at Canton were raided, 20,000 chests of opium were destroyed, and the entrance to the Pearl River was blocked. The British responded forcefully and destroyed the blockade, occupied the island of Hong Kong, and sent their fleet up the Pearl River to intimidate the Daoguang Emperor. When negotiations failed, they attacked and occupied Canton. After a year of war throughout China, the British captured Nanjing and extracted favorable peace terms. To get them to leave, China paid a large sum, surrendered control of Hong Kong, and allowed foreign access to other harbors, including Shanghai, which is now the world's busiest port. Back in Hong Kong, Christian missionaries started schools and churches to spread Jesus, but slinging religion and drugs wasn't enough for the British. They wanted to make more money. Meanwhile, back on the mainland, a man named Hong Seo Chen was having visions that he was the younger brother of Jesus. He gained a huge following of peasants and launched a long and bloody rebellion against the Qing dynasty. With China engulfed in civil war, the British saw their opening. This time, they teamed up with the French to invade the mainland, sack Beijing, and burn down the emperor's summer palace. They used this victory to negotiate control of the Kowloon Peninsula, giving the British both sides of Hong Kong's main waterway, now called Victoria Harbor. A few years later, the British extracted a 99-year lease of the surrounding islands. As Hong Kong westernized, the differences between it and the rest of China grew. One of the widest divides was in education. While studying at Hong Kong College of Medicine, Sun Yat-sen and a group of friends plotted their successful revolution to take down the Chinese Empire. Today, Sun is considered the father of the Republic of China. Fast forward to 1941. The same morning Japan attacked the United States at Pearl Harbor. It launched an assault on Hong Kong, which the British surrendered after an 18-day battle. For three years, the Japanese violently ruled the territory under martial law. Of the 1.6 million people who lived there when the invasion took place, more than 1 million had fled or were deported by the time the Japanese were defeated to end the Second World War. After Japan left, the British re-established control. Despite the decolonization happening in the rest of their empire, the British were determined to keep Hong Kong, even if the city and its economy was just a skeleton of its former self. China's civil war in 1949 helped turn that around. The Communist Party's victory forced Shanghai's capitalist class to flee to Hong Kong. This transformed it into a thriving manufacturing center. But working conditions were poor and squatter camps grew out of control. 53,000 people were left homeless when a fire ripped through one of these shanty towns. The housing shortage led to the embrace of the high-rises that now define the Hong Kong skyline. When war broke out in Korea in 1950, the West blocked all trade with China. With access cut off to mainland markets, Hong Kong's economy suffered a sharp downturn that amplified social unrest. To recover, Hong Kong's capitalists turned to high-tech electronics and finance. In the 1970s and 80s, with Hong Kong finally thriving again, China demanded that Britain hand over the entire territory in 1997 when the 99-year lease over the new territories was set to expire. Wary of the Chinese, but eager to avoid a breakdown in relations, Britain agreed to surrender the new territories, the Kowloon Peninsula and Hong Kong Island itself, but only after giving them a Bill of Rights and forcing China to agree to a one-country, two-systems policy. This gave China control, but allowed Hong Kong and Macau, the other special administrative region, to keep their capitalist economic and political systems for 50 years. In the two decades since the handover, Hong Kong's economy has remained open and strong, but China has begun to assert more control. In 2014, massive demonstrations successfully blocked Beijing from implementing national education in Hong Kong's schools, although protesters failed to pressure the central government to allow them to directly elect their own chief executive. 
Instead, Hong Kongers choose from a handful of candidates approved by Beijing. As we move ever closer to the date of full reunification with the rest of China in 2047, many questions remain unanswered about Hong Kong's future. Thanks for watching. For more on China, check out our mini documentaries on China's domestic mega projects and the many they plan to build in the rest of the world. Until next time, for TDC, I'm Bryce Plank.